Yo guys, welcome to the Zelda Fiction. Today we are gonna see, what if Naruto fell in love with Esdith. Part 2. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. There were many things in the world that had shocked Naruto in his life. The first and foremost had been that Raymond existed the food of the gods. And then less than a week later that for some reason, not everyone loved the food of the gods as much as he did. That and many other things paled into insignificance now. Why? The capital is huge. He simply could not believe that something could be so massive as to cover everything in sight. And he meant everything. Even the distant mountain in the distance was actually the imperial palace. Armin and Jurea glanced at each other. The Sanin was dumbstruck. Armin just sighed. I thought I told the both of you that the capital was massive. Naruto whirled around. Massive one of the hidden villages is massive. This place is as big as ten of them in one place. He turned back around gazing at the titanic spires of marble that rose high into the sky in the distance. This city is hell. The QB might need a whole day to destroy this place. It's colossal. Armin swallowed hard at that and glanced towards Jiraiya. Don't ask. He didn't, but turned back to the blonde. Hey. It might be night time, but there are still guards about. I'm not sought after, but I'm still not strictly allowed to be here. And you both have said repeatedly that you shouldn't draw attention to yourselves. Naruto suddenly became very quiet as if responding to his warning. His body was very still. Armin sighed. Good then let's find an inn for the night. I am very sore from all this traveling. Ureya. The Sanin's head snapped to Naruto's whose own gaze had been drawn to the side. Naruto never called him by his name unless he was very serious about something. It was almost a watchword for danger or readiness. What is it Naruto? Blood I smell lots of blood. And Rod his nose scrunched up in disgust. It was faint, coming from the east, but as soon as I heightened my sense of smell it became overpowering. It's like one of Orochimaru's labs only the scent of decay is stronger. It smells like a prison and a torture room mixed together. Dureya frowned and turned to Armin. Know what it might be? I don't he was also pale, but from the description, not the scent. He couldn't tell what they were talking about. He smelled nothing out of the ordinary. Certainly nothing rotten, nor the iron tang of fresh blood. I don't smell anything wrong and I don't know why you would. This is a residential district, not an area with a prison or anything like that. In fact the area we're in isn't far from the homes of the moderately wealthy. Naruto scowled. I feel something bad he jumped over to Armin and bit his thumb. Hold out your hand. What? Just do it. Armin nodded and gave Naruto his hand, watching as the boy drew on his skin, using his fresh blood as ink. It disgusted him but he didn't move, already knowing this was a skill shinobi like them possessed. Naruto finished a few moments later and spoke under his breath. Fuin. The blood shimmered and dried in an instant. Naruto looked up into his eyes. Don't rub it off got it. Armin nodded again, and Jiraiya put a hand on his shoulder. Listen, me and Naruto are going to see what's going on. You go find yourself a room for three at an inn and leave word that we will be arriving. That mark will allow us to find you easily enough. Now go. The older man gave him a light push, and. Seeming melted away into the night shadows. Armin watched for a second and then jogged off to find the nearest inn. He hoped fervently that they didn't do anything to get themselves in trouble. It would not go well for them as a whole if they did. Naruto's eyes took in the scope of the mansion it was huge. Almost the size of Hokage's tower, but not round in shape, and it had a far different kind of aesthetic the white and brown walls, the dusky orange roof were styled with sharp corners and gave off a kind of noble feel. He guessed that was the point though. These rich people loved to flaunt what they had. He frowned. That scent of rod and fleshly spilled blood. It didn't come from the mansion but rather behind it. He growled inwardly and scanned the area for traps or some manner of security. He didn't see anything besides the one guard at the door, oblivious as a blind sheep to a skilled ninja. He drew out a kunai and darted across the deeply shadowed street and to the left side of the house. Then he ran along the side of the wall following his nose as the repulsive scent grew stronger. It was disgusting, but he knew that he needed to find the source. Some feeling told him it was important. And not just the fact that there generally weren't torture facilities in residential areas, much less wealthy ones. He gripped his kunai tighter as his nose told him to turn left into the small wooded area behind the mansion. His apprehension only grew then under the scent of decay and fresh blood, he smelled the acrid tang and noxious sweet scent of poison. Something he was well acquainted with after raiding a few of Orochimaru's hideouts with his sensei. He hated that scent. Naruto hissed in distaste as he broke through the trees on the other side of the woods and stopped in front of a large shack. His eyes fell on the door which was cracked open slightly, dim yellow light shining through. He froze as the smell of death overwhelmed him. It was making him nauseous. He quickly cut the chakra running to his nose and shuddered. What was going on in there? He made up his mind and stalked across the clearing, aware that there were two guards at either side of the doors. 
They didn't even notice as he crept directly between them and placed his eye to the door. His pupils contracted at the bright light even inside, adjusting quickly. What he saw made him sick. Inside there were two blonde women hovering around a girl her hair was long and dirty, once a glossy black, it had faded with neglect and filth. Her skin had probably once been fair. Dot but was now yellowed and purple from bruising where her skin wasn't torn and red, crusty with scabs. His eyes trailed down her nude form. She was chained by her wrists to the ceiling, while her ankles had been tied as well, stretching her painfully. Even now Naruto watched as the younger of the two blonde women. Little older than a girl used a small razor to cut lacerations in her belly. Blood poured out of the deep slashes. The red seeped, dripping down her body, overwhelming even his unenhanced senses at this point. The iron and rust, salty taste in the back of his mouth was overwhelming. What they were doing to her was wrong. It would end now. Without a sound Naruto was inside the room, the doors opening wide. Behind him two shadow clones disposed of the guards, he had no mercy for them. If they had any conscience or good in them they'd risk their jobs to bring this to justice. As it was they shared just as much guilt for letting it continue. Naruto felt like nothing more than death incarnate as he strode into the room, silent as the death god himself. His blue eyes were cold as they fell on the two women. The elder looked up as he approached her pretty face, registering surprise a split second before he nailed her hand to a table with his kunai. At the same moment he slapped a seal over her mouth that he had in a quick use seal on his wrist. Her scream was instantly silenced as Naruto turned his attention to the younger girl. Her blonde hair was flipped to one side of her face as her head whipped towards him. Naruto's hand caught her by the throat. Her eyes flew open wide and she choked. He calmly effortlessly twisted. Then he dropped her, letting her corpse fall to the floor in a heap. His anger would not allow him to let her live a moment longer. The moment behind him made him spin. He deftly caught the surgical blade that had been aimed for his neck and staring into the older woman's eyes, snapped her wrist. She let out a silent scream and fell to her knees. Naruto sneered at the pain he was inflicting. She had no right to cry. The tears that suddenly welled in her eyes made him growl. Pathetic excuse for a woman. Who do you think you are to torture someone like this? He gripped the corner of the seal covering her mouth, his voice cutting through the air like a whip. The guards outside are already dead and if you scream I'll do the same thing to you that you've done to her, but trust me, I can make it last longer. She gasped as he ripped the paper off her mouth. Who? None of your business. I am someone who's found out what you've been doing. That and how you're going to help save this girl's life is all you need to worry about. Naruto pointed at the chain holding the girl and sent a tiny wind blade at it. As the razor of air severed the chain he made two clones, which caught her gently. Naruto turned his gaze back to the woman. Let me be extremely clear. I don't care who you are. For what you were doing to her you are the trash of humanity, and you're lucky I'm undercover, or I would have dragged you straight to have you hanged. I will kill you got it. But unless you do your best to heal her I'll make sure you go down slowly. His gaze drilled into hers. Understood. No. Kill me brat. Naruto scoffed. One hand lashed out and broke her nose, sending blood sheeting. He had no patience for this creature masquerading as a woman. People like her needed to be removed from existence. Easily arranged. I'm not some brat either. I'm not going to tell you a second time. If you've poisoned her then administer an antidote. And don't think you can sneak anything past me bitch. I can tell when you lie and smell when you are trying something underhanded. She scowled. Why should I help you if you will kill me either way? Do I look like an idiot go to hell? It's not whether you die or not it's how long it takes he cracked his knuckles. Not that it matters. I told you that I wouldn't tell you a second time. I'm not wasting my time waiting for her to bleed out. Naruto pointed his finger at the center of her forehead. Mini air bullet. PHFT. Red splattered the ground and wall behind her as she toppled to the ground. Naruto spat on her body before he nodded to his clones. Do what you can until Jiraiya catches up. They nodded back and began to go over her wounds with a critical eye. Naruto turned away and examined the rest of the room. There were corpses hanging all over the place like pigs in a butcher shop storeroom. Orochimaru's hidden bases had nothing on this place. Where he had done his work for experimentation making himself and his servants stronger, these two had been doing it out of enjoyment. They were evil beyond the standard definition. He could tolerate torture. He was a shinobi. It may have taken a year for Jiraiya to drill that into his head, but he could stand it now. What he couldn't and refused to ever put up with was this. Those who tortured others in this way for nothing more than their own sick enjoyment. In his short time with the Sanin he hadn't encountered many who were like this. Rapist, murderers, and the scum of the world sure but this. He didn't see this too often. It was disgusting and made the bile rise in his throat just to look at it all. His eyes narrowed as he scanned the racks. If he didn't have more self-control when it came to this kind of thing, he'd have already put this place to the torch with one of his bigger fire jutsu. 
Either that or turned the whole place into a pile of splinters with wind not that it would help anything. It was just a way to vent his frustration. Shit like this wasn't supposed to happen. The law was tasked with upholding order and peace. And this butcher house was most certainly against order. This was just carefully hidden carnage. Holy shit Gaki this is the worst I've seen since my time helping the Kiri rebellion. Naruto turned at Jiraiya's voice. The older man was looking around with a grim expression. Hey sensei, this girl here is alive, but she needs toad oil to treat her external injuries as fast as we can. Otherwise she'll bleed to death before we figure out what's wrong on the inside. Got it. Naruto walked away from Jiraiya who was already summoning one of the toads to fetch the healing oil. He stepped between the racks and cages, looking for signs of life among the dead. It wasn't long before he found some. Across the room, in a cage, was a young man. Naruto guessed he was about his own age, but frail and starved. Hey are you awake? Naruto grasped the boy's hand through the bars of the cage. Wake up. The boy seemed to stir slowly, his eyes drifting open. W dot what? Dot no. Don't touch me again. He leapt back from the front of the cage, only to see Naruto instead of his jailers. Wait. Dot w dot who are you? My name is Naruto. I killed the two women who were here torturing people. Give me a second and I'll have you out of there. Naruto nodded to him as the boy's shocked eyes locked onto his. The blonde closed his eyes briefly and then funneled trace amounts of wind chakra into his fingertips, sharpening the blades until they would cut through almost anything. Then he swiped at the cage bars, high and low. They fell apart with an iron clang. Come on. I'm looking for survivors. We already have the girl down from over there. Do you know if there are any others that are still alive here? No, he muttered half-heartedly. We're the last two. Dot. Can you answer a few questions then? He looked up. The dark circles under his eyes were so pronounced that to Naruto they looked like black coins. Yeah you you saved me. I'll tell you anything you want. Naruto cut to the chase. Who else is involved with this? What is their scam and who needs to die? The. Dot guards are all involved that girl lures people and travelers in. Offers them a place to stay for the night, then drugs them and brings them here. Mimi and Seo were separated from our friend Tatsumi, he had all the money, and we had all the food and supplies. When we came here we couldn't buy a room for the night and ended up meeting that that bitch. She took us here and let us stay for dinner. They drugged our food. Was she poisoned? I can smell it on the air, but I don't know what it is. No not yet. He coughed loudly and covered his mouth. Blood soon dripped between his fingers. They were saying that they would do it tonight and then make me watch. Naruto nodded. I'm glad I made it in time, but who else do I need to kill to make sure this doesn't continue? He growled out the last part, making it clear those left responsible were going to suffer. But the woman's husband the guards I don't know who else. A a man came yesterday, but he didn't do anything except talk with that woman. Dottie left and I never caught his name or face. Good. Now how are you hurt? The wet chuckled made the boy's chest heave. Every possible way I can think of. Just. Dot just help Sayo first okay. Dot I can handle the pain. Naruto smirked. No need. Let me help you over to my sensei. He'll get both of you healed as best we can for now. Then it'll be time for me to go take out the trash. By the way what's your name? Leasu my friend over there. Dot is Sayo. Got it. Naruto put his shoulder under Leasu's arm so he could support the other and walked across the room to where Jiraiya was already tending to the girl. He then let the boy lay down on the cool stone floor as Jiraiya smoothed the special toad oil over Seo's wounds. Already they were healing which was odd because usually only he healed that fast with the oil. Sensei. How is she doing? Jiraiya shook his head. You can't tell. The oil is working faster than usual not sure why, but I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. Fine but as soon as they can be moved we need to get out of here. Right I leave torching the place to you. Naruto growled his thanks and bent to tend Leasu's injures with his sensei. I'm only 16 for fuck's sake. I'm not supposed to be saying that I'm too old for this shit. Jiraiya shook his head. Naruto no matter how old you are you're always too old for this now stop being so pissed and help me. Right. Naruto was awake in bed long after Jiraiya and Armin along with their two guests had been asleep. The events of the night were nagging at him along with a few other things that refused to put his mind at ease. For one he was furious about what he'd heard from Armin that such things were ignored by most of the higher ups in the capital. How could they ignore that shit? It was happening right under their noses, and they couldn't rightly allow it to continue. But then again it gave credence to Armin's original story about the capital being corrupt to its core. He really wanted to go to the guards after that and report everything, but common sense and a healthy sucker punch from Jiraiya settled that down quick enough. But it still left him feeling hollow. All those people who would never get to achieve their dreams, lured away by that evil family, he had half a mind to send out a couple cousin clones to do that damn guards jobs for them. 
maybe he could give a whole new meaning to the term vigilante. After a few dozen of those corrupt officials and their hateful benefactors were hanging from their necks in the street, maybe the capital's government would sit up and rule their fucking country. And yet again that was what Armin wanted them here for. In his mind the capital's government was already too far gone. He wanted them to save his home by any means necessary. And Naruto was just beginning to see just how big a task that would be. Originally he thought they were going to a village like one of the five big ones back home. They'd take out a few bad guys and maybe call in reinforcements if some bigger threat showed up, but now that was a ludicrous thought. The capital was so massive that he could spam clones all day and all night and not see it all. He doubted even the most experienced street urchin or the oldest guardsman could even memorize a fourth of the massive city. It wasn't like Kanoha Kanoha was a city that was called a village. The capital was a landscape that was called a city. It wasn't so much a city as a terrain. A geography how were they supposed to deal with the root of corruption here? He'd need to go full biju mode just to make any progress. The task, which had a week ago been exciting, now seemed daunting. And that wasn't even the only thing on his mind no, he had so many other things to worry about. Of course there was the old one. The Akatsuki was still after him and if they chased after him, then he'd have to fight them with guaranteed no backup. And also there was his training with the QP's chakra. He still hadn't mastered the demon's power and it was starting to wear on him. How long would it take for him to be able to use the QP's power, as Jureya said his mother could. And then there was Esdith the woman of his dreams, literally. He still couldn't stop thinking about her. Even now, consumed by other things, she lingered in the back of his mind. The very fact that his thoughts had turned to her conjured her image granted he'd only seen her twice. Dot but as he'd realized before, he simply couldn't forget a single detail. It was as if his brain refused to surrender the clarity of her mental picture to time. The curve of her lips evoked a feeling in him that was so hard to ignore. He wanted to hold caress. Dot kiss. Dot. Nibble, bite everything he wanted to run his fingers through her bright sapphire hair, mark her pale shoulders every night he dreamed of that and so much more. If he didn't meet her again, either in that special dream or in real life, he was sure he'd go crazy. Naruto growled into the softness of his bed. He just wanted her. Was that too much to ask? But it didn't seem to matter. It seemed that every time he went to sleep he was just tortured by visions of what he could be doing. And then both times he'd actually been with her in what he was starting to think was a connected mindscape, he'd been woken up. It was so infuriating that he almost wanted to kill Jiraiya that second time. His chest ached when he thought of what she'd been about to say to him ARRGGG. He hissed and forced himself to relax. There was no point in agonizing over it. He'd just have to wait as much as it annoyed the ever-loving crap out of him to do so. His eyes closed and he willed himself to fall asleep. Naruto. Naruto's eyes snapped open at the voice and he was sitting up an instant later. He looked around. Yes. Dottie was here. This place was where he'd met her twice before. He didn't see her immediately so she must be. Suddenly he was tackled to the side by someone oh he knew who it was his head turned and his eyes alit on her perfect skin and blue eyes. She was smiling, grinning, her face blooming red even now. Naruto. Bezdeeth. Dottie was cut off as her lips slammed against his without warning. And that was all it took. Hands were set loose to wander as he pushed back, tasting her lips. They were like flower petals so soft. Naruto felt his self-control disappear then. Before another second passed her cool hands were curling up under his jacket and shirt. Her tongue asked permission and he gave it. Naruto groaned as he was levered back. She straddled him as his hands found her toned belly, scratching along it with long strokes. Her muscles quivered under his touch, sending his restraint out the window. He broke the kiss much to Esdith's obvious displeasure, only to kiss her neck, nibbling down to her collarbone. Esdith's moan spurred him further as he bit her throat softly, marking her with his sharp canines. Every time he did so, her fingers would scratch across his chest, and her legs would tighten on either side of his hips. Naruto groaned as his growing erection strained. Esdith evidently noticed because she started to grind down slowly. Her face lowered to his as he left off her neck. She was very red, her cheeks and neck painted crimson. At the same time her hands had retreated, now simply resting on his lower abdomen. She panted quietly, attempting to get her breathing under control. Naruto reluctantly did the same, but found himself unable to dull his excitement as she never stopped grinding. They stayed like that for a moment longer before he managed to speak, somewhat out of breath. So how were you? Dot. She took a deep breath and pushed forward to kiss him with as much passion as she could muster. He accepted it, his member throbbing hard with the beat of his heart. Meanwhile he dropped his hands from her belly to the floor and levered himself up. Esdith stayed like that for a second and then pulled back, her lips reddening from the force of the kiss. How do you think I've been doing? I can't stop thinking about you, and I can't concentrate on anything she bit her lip and leaned forward again, kissing him lightly. 
Naruto returned it, savoring the contact. His heart beat faster as Ezdeath's tongue darted out to lick his lips. How about you? He chuckled. Same here you can't imagine how happy I am that we met again tonight. Oh I think I can Naruto groaned as Ezdeath gave another enthusiastic grind into his crotch. But we have a lot to talk about we don't know when we will be interrupted this time. Sorry, he sighed. It's been my end both times. The guys I'm traveling with have been warned though. But Ezdeath practically purred. Now where are you? Dot. The capital A small inn on the west side near the residential district. It's called the Winking Wyvern or something. Naruto saw her eyes light up with excitement at his words. Are you in the capital too? Yes. She cried, leaning in for another deep kiss. It kept them occupied for nearly three minutes before Naruto broke it off. He made a mental note to beat the living shit out of Jiraiya for delaying this more than a week. The old man really had it coming. So? Dot where are you? The Imperial Palace. But I can be out in the city tomorrow early. Ezdi's smile was at once aroused and predatory. Where can we meet? Naruto shook his head. Don't know I've never been to the capital before. You know better than I, but I could ask for directions I just don't want my traveling companions to see you yet. She frowned. Why not? He sighed as she stilled and leaned closer, her nose less than an inch from his. Listen Esdith Chan I'm not from this country at all. I can honestly say that I don't know what I wouldn't do for you at this point, but it's all so sudden. We understand this attraction but they might not. Besides, I'm part of a military that's probably going to be opposed to yours in the near future. I see not a problem though. Naruto inhaled her scent as she spoke. Then asked, why not? You don't even know what country I'm from yet. Because I have no connections in the capital that are worth keeping. There are things I enjoy, but none of them do I absolutely require the capital for. As Deeth's eyes focused on him more strongly. I find myself unable to think of doing anything other than her blush deepened even further. Being with you. I. It doesn't matter. She placed one finger to his lips. I am sick and tired of things getting in the way of me meeting you in person. And the gods have mercy on the soul of any living being who gets in my way now so Naruto please meet me at Brill's blacksmith tomorrow. It's on the north side of the capital, and any guardsman worth his commission can point you in the right direction. He nodded. Will we speak there or go somewhere else? Naruto captured her lips briefly before whispering in her ear, I would like some real private time with you. As Deeth moaned in his ear, is that a promise? It is. He grinned. And you should know, I never break my promise without an incredibly good reason if that. I'll keep that in mind she shifted in his lap again and pouted. So now that our meeting is secure tell me a bit about you. Since you already know what I am I'd like to know what my future husband does for a living. Um I kill people. Ezdeath started grinding again. MMM. More specific. Dot another groan escaped him as she wrapped her arms around his neck, using the leverage to increase the pressure. Fuck I'm a member of Kanahagakur's military the country across the sea to the west I'm pretty low ranking right now, only a genin, but I haven't had a chance to get promoted yet. I'm still technically on a training trip with my godfather. We call ourselves shinobi. Shinobi? Naruto nodded. You would call us an entire country ruled and governed by assassins, defended by assassins, who war with other assassin villages. Except when I say village I mean more cities kinda like the capital's way to damned big to consider a city at all. How interesting Esdith's lips found their way to his again, meeting his softly. Again he didn't even try to pull back, actually pressing forward to deepen the contact. But after a moment she withdrew, her eyes resting on his. Assassins formed a government. That must be interesting. It's kind of normal actually. Only a few of us really fit the definition of true assassins anymore. I'm what's called an ninjutsu specialist. And that is. Someone who focuses on powerful elemental attacks meant to devastate large areas. He grinned. I'd like to think I'm probably the most suited to ninjutsu in my whole village. I was born with a massive amount of energy to draw from. Ezdith smirked. I can feel that you radiate power. It's addicting in more than one way. She kissed him again, trailing down to bite at his neck. Her voice warmed his skin as she asked, so why are you here in the empire anyway? Naruto groaned, pushing Ezdith away and down. She looked up, suddenly finding him on top. Her lips formed a sultry pout. Oh I like being in charge. And me too. He growled low in his throat as he cupped her thigh with his hand, running up to her firm rear and squeezing. Then he smoothed over to the center of her belly, scratching as he went. I can't believe how good it feels to touch you like this, and you let me do it. Dot. Why not? I fully intend on making you mine, but that works both ways does it not? Her finger drew down from his back to rest over his solar plexus. And I get the feeling you aren't the submissive type. Am I right? He chuckled, stroking up towards the undersides of her breasts. Good intuition as Deeth Chan. Chan? A term from my country. Used for boys, referring to girls usually. You're my girl aren't you? 
As Dee's face bloomed a deeper shade of red at his words, even as she wrapped her legs around him. Do I have to repeat myself? You are mine and vice versa. Naruto's face descended till it was barely an inch from hers. Good I don't think I could stay away from you now. He dipped his head, kissing her milky white shoulder and then biting her. His sharp canines left her unblemished skin marked red. I still don't know why this even feels like it does, but I can't seem to care. I just want to do it in the real world. This stupid dream is so goddamn tempting. She nodded slowly, but her eyes had gone unfocused. As Deeth shifted under him, responding to his actions. Don't. Dot you dare stop. Why would I? Naruto kissed her again, taking her lips between his teeth and sucking on it. As Deeth almost purred as he released it and kissed her again, hard. Gureya frowned slightly as he observed his student. Naruto was lying in one of the beds they'd rented for the night in a local inn. This wasn't disturbing or strange in and of itself. It wasn't as if they didn't sleep in a good inn every chance they got. After all being a shinobi was hard enough without having to sleep in the woods. What made the act of sleeping strange in this case was how active Naruto was. The toad sage scratched his chin and thought as he watched Naruto toss and turn. He hadn't stopped rolling over and adjusting himself for at least a half an hour. That was odd. Jiraiya had always known Naruto to be a heavy sleeper. Nothing short of a brick to the side of the head would wake him up sometimes. And he rarely stirred. So this restlessness was very unusual. But that was really only foreshadowing. What really alarmed him was what Naruto was muttering in his sleep. Or more to the point the name he was muttering. Ezdith. Jiraiya's brow furrowed even more. What was going on? Naruto had been acting strange for a while now. Ever since the boat ride across the sea. It started out as him being a little less observant. And then it degenerated into outright listlessness. He wasn't even paying attention to where he was walking half the time, eyes focused inward. Plus his temper had been going downhill fast over the last 10 days. Now Jiraiya knew that Naruto, unlike how most understood him, had a very short temper. He just masked his anger exceedingly well. So when Naruto threatened him with ripping his balls of and feeding them to him, it came as a bit of a shock. Sure Naruto threatened him sometimes several times a day. But he'd never made a threat like that and at the same time been completely serious. Naruto abruptly rolled off the bed. Thump. Gureya's eyes widened, and he quickly shun shined out of the room and back to his bed. He would ask Naruto about his odd behavior tomorrow when there wasn't a chance that his student would try to kill him. Blinking awake, Naruto found himself peering under his bed from the floor. His mind was blank for a few moments, attempting to process this latest interruption. Why? Why couldn't he just be left alone to sleep for an hour? Why was it that when he had an actual dream about Isdith, he would have the full eight hours, but when he was speaking to the real one it never lasted more than a few minutes? Granted this third time seemed to be the charm and he'd been able to spend. But he had no idea how long it had been since he fell asleep. Time was quite forgotten when he was there with her. The last thing he remembered was Isdith moaning into his mouth as he kissed her. Fuck. Naruto sat up, growling as he scanned the room. There was no sign of anyone else. The door was closed. Well, so much for carrying out his threat to his sensei Naruto rubbed at his neck, where he could still feel the phantom touch of lips. Damn now he couldn't even beat the shit out of anyone for waking him up. After all he'd woken himself. He stood. Instantly his sharp eyes noted the depression in the leather seat of the chair, which was slowing rising back into place. Almost as though someone had been sitting there a moment ago. Naruto blinked and a feral grin spread across his lips. Someone had been sitting in his room. Someone who was going to be in a lot of pain when they woke up. Of course he couldn't know who it had been. Armin or Jiraiya. Armin made more sense though. After all Jiraiya knew he was serious about his earlier threat. So it probably wasn't him. But he couldn't be sure so he'd just have to punish both of them. Not as severely as he initially planned for the situation, but still enough to instill a real sense of fear. Oh fuck it. I don't give a damn. Naruto laid back down and closed his eyes. He would get back at them another time at the moment he was more interested in thinking about his meeting with Esdith the next day. Jiraiya and Armin's reckonings could wait. The following morning. Jiraiya let loose a mighty yawn and stretched his arms out to each side of the bed. Well, to be more precise, he tried to stretch his arms out. What happened instead was he opened his eyes, tilting his head up to find himself bound hand and foot a meter in the air. Ropes, secured by kunai in the room's walls, kept him suspended in the air. Gureya was momentarily alarmed until his eyes adjusted to the light coming through the window. He then saw the note that was suspended about two feet in front of his face on ninja wire. He squinted to make out the writing. Gureya, if you are reading this it means the sleeping potion I made has finally worn off. You are currently suspended one meter off the bed, bound with that chakra absorbing rope you love so much. The bed under you is strapped with kunai and razor wire. If you move too much the kunai will pull free of the walls, and you will fall on the kunai. 
At the same time, if you channel chakra the explosive tags that are stuck in your underwear would go off. Feel free to help Harmon when you get free. He is in a similar position, but seeing who he is you may not have much time to get free. Good luck. The SI will be going out into the capital to scout today. I'll send a messenger toad if I learn anything. Also any expenses incurred by the explosives will be on your tab. Naruto Uzumaki. Hiraya groaned and let his head drop slowly back. A few seconds passed. Then he heard the shouting from the room over. Sweat broke out on his brow. Oh shit. Naruto sighed, a 10,000 kilowatt smile upon his face. He strolled down the streets of the capital with his hands in his pockets and Esdeef on the brain. He simply couldn't imagine being happier at that moment or at least not until he met Esdeef in person. Right now it was about 10 in the morning. The sun shone high in the sky, casting its bright rays upon the capital. Naruto thought it looked like one of those amazing paintings that people did completely from memory. The city was a landscape rolling hills of buildings and parks abounded. It was beautiful. And it also smelled, which annoyed him more than he was willing to admit. His sense of smell, which was much keener than the average human or even the average shinobi, was registering the taint of the street side gutters and the unpleasant scent of civilians emptying their trash. It didn't help that he could hear the disconsolate mutterings of civilians walking past him. It didn't seem as though most people were nearly as happy as he was. Naruto imagined that this was a sad thing. Wouldn't it be great if everyone could feel how he did right now? Going to meet someone like Esdith he let out another sigh and commanded his eyes to search out a guardsman as soon as he could. Currently he was heading north, although he had no idea if this was the right direction to find the blacksmith shop that Esdith directed him to. But she did say that any good guardsman could point the way. So first things first. He needed to find one. And about 10 minutes later he saw one. It was an older man dressed in fashionable, yet oddly flimsy looking, armor. Naruto spotted him even as he jogged out of an alley and into the street. He could also hear the sounds of a commotion coming closer. Thinking to get the information he needed before whatever conflict approaching them arrived, Naruto darted over to the man. Hey. I was wondering if you could tell me where to find TH. Whatever he had been about to say died in his throat as he heard the frantic scream of a small girl. His head snapped to the side just in time to see six more guards dragging two girls out of the ally, their arms bound tightly behind them. Naruto instantly recognized one of them from the posters liberally scattered on almost every message board he's seen since he left the inn. The other looked to be no older than 13 with cherry red hair and a badly bleeding gash on her forehead. Naruto's eyes took in the scene with startling clarity as he realized what was happening. The older of the two girls was beautiful with long purple hair and somber eyes. Although her looks were marred by the shattered pair of glasses that had been jammed into her face, leaving the bloody imprint of the metal rims. She was a member of Night Raid. She was one of the people listed on the wanted posters. And although he hadn't caught her name, he guessed she was one of the people Armin had mentioned to them. About now he was wishing he'd paid more attention to what they talked about, instead of daydreaming about Esdith and ignoring useful need-to-know information. Obviously she had been caught and was being dragged to whatever counted for a prison here. Obviously this was not good for him. The very fact that there was a 95% chance that he and Jurea would be fighting the Empire at this point meant they needed Night Raid's cooperation. And Armin already told them that he could contact the Rebellion and through them Night Raid. Which meant that he couldn't afford to let her be captured. If she was captured she would likely die, but if he saved her then it might allow him and Jurea to contact Night Raid without having to go through his other contacts. That would be a big help if they could cut to the chase and meet with the frontline fighters first. Naruto growled low in his throat. He didn't want to take even this much time away from meeting Esdith, but the benefits to the operation far outweighed the few minutes he would need to save her. After all this might be a favor he could call in later if they needed it. As a shinobi he knew how valuable a debt like that could be. So he simply couldn't afford to let her be captured. Esdith would have to wait just a little bit longer. Shield grunted in pain as the guards hauled her along the street. She didn't know what had gone wrong. One moment she'd been taking out the target with her bare hands. She couldn't take her scissors since they were too well recognized, and then the next moment the man she was killing decided to use some unknown martial arts on her. At first she was put off guard when she suddenly couldn't land even a single hit on the guy. And then she felt a fist like a steel ingot crash into her throat. Her ability to breath was instantly cut off, and she fell back with a gasp. He was on her a split second after that, and before she even realized it she was captured. It was a good thing she brought back at this time. Leon had come along and thank god, a came as well. With those two trailing them, there was no way she would get killed. At least as long as Leon and Akame managed to get an opportunity to rescue her. But for now she had to play the part of the defeated criminal. She hated acting like that. She raised her head as the guards pulled her into the light of the main street heading towards the palace. 
She groaned in pain, which with how tight her bindings were, she didn't need to fake in the least. Her eyes showed her the six guards around her and the one in front, clearing the way in a blur. A sound like a blade cleaving though water rushed in her ears and everything went black. She heard a scream, shouts, and several thuds. Her panicked mind told her this was just a Kame and Leon making their move, but that wasn't what it was at all. A hand suddenly grabbed her, and then an arm wrapped around her waist as she was lifted into the air. Sheil didn't shout, keeping silent, as whoever it was hauled her away at a blistering pace. She, along with her rescuer, exited a cloud of thick smoke and blasted down the street and out of the guard's sight. The city around her literally seemed to blur, details becoming indistinguishable. Before she could blink they were five blocks away from the alley she was just dragged out of. The world turned 90 degrees, and she barely restrained the urge to scream as the one carrying her took to the air. A scream rent the air at the apex of their leap, and Sheil realized that the other girl who had been with her was slung over the other shoulder. The red-headed teen was far from silent. A second later she felt the wind rushing past her face, and her rescuer landed on the roof of the building. Sheil found herself unceremoniously dropped. But in a surprising twist, her bonds had already been severed. When did that happen? She drew in a deep breath and attempted to get her bearings. She was sitting on a rooftop quite a distance from where she was captured. Beside her was the girl who tried to save her for some reason. And standing only a few feet from her was the most handsome young man she'd ever seen. Sheil unconsciously adjusted her damaged glasses and tried to get a better look at him. He was tall with blonde hair and deep tanned skin. His face bore three jagged black marks on either side, and as he took a breath she saw long sharpened canines. The most startling feature was his eyes. Blue as the sea after a storm with slitted black pupils that reminded her of Leon in her battle form. He was very attractive and had she not been in this particular situation, she might have blushed. But as it was she only stared stupidly as he scanned the rooftops around them. It required a moment before she was able to articulate a response to his impromptu rescue. W.H. Dot who are you? He seemed satisfied with the state of their pursuit if there was any, and he turned to look at her. A feral grin pulled at his lips, again reminding her of Leon. Ah my name isn't something I just hand out Assassin Chan. His grin widened. You're pretty lucky I have a really strong conscience. Otherwise I wouldn't have broken my cover to get you out of their night raid. Shield tensed. You know who I am? Well duh your picture is pretty much everywhere. And I'm usually observant enough to notice seemingly inconsequential details hours after seeing them. A few hundred wanted posters over an hour or so is certainly enough to jog my memory. Besides I've heard a lot about your group recently. And where have you heard about us from may I ask? She grunted as she stood to look him in the eye. No offense sir. I'm thankful you saved me, however Night Raid doesn't need any more enemies than it already has. Oh come on he raised one eyebrow. If I had any intention in fighting Night Raid I would have let them drag you away. I only rescued you because I needed to contact your people sooner or later. You might say you got captured at a really convenient time for me. Again I ask where. He sighed. You're really insistent for someone who just got their ass saved. Sheesh and here I thought people had manners these days. He rolled his eyes at her. Listen, just like you wouldn't tell me where your secret base is just because I asked I can't just tell you where I learned about your organization. Suffice to say me and my allies were brought in by someone who opposes Prime Minister Honest. I saved you because we're probably on the same side. Probably. She frowned. Why probably? Because my allies aren't fighting to save your country. My allies are worried about our own country. Let me put it this way. I come from a country that Honest will eventually try to invade once he's done taking over this continent. I'm part of a group that will ensure that he won't bring war to our home. Like I said, we aren't here to save you. We're here to help ourselves and if it just so happens to kill Honest and bring peace back that's good all around. He shrugged as if there wasn't any more else to say. Shields frown deepened. So you're from out of the country and you're here to make sure Honest doesn't take over your homeland as soon as he's finished conquering everything around the Empire. Basically. And you would consider working with Night Raid. Yeah I mean from what I've heard about you, your group isn't the most powerful. I could probably kill most of your members without too much trouble, but your group has all the info we need on Honest and the Empire. Strengths, weaknesses and the like. He looked away from her, his muscles tensing with nervous tension. Anyway. I saved you, told you why we're here, and offered to work with you at some point. That's good enough for me right now. We'll find a way to get in contact with you some other time. Right now I'm meeting with someone she's probably waiting for me already. Sheil tilted her head as he cursed under his breath and paced to the edge of the roof. Who are you meeting? He didn't answer. Could you at least give me something to call you? He turned back. Well let me think how about this. You can call me Kitsune. Fox. What? You got a problem with that? No. Kitsune sighed. I'm taking off. Good luck. 
Shield blinked and was about to call out when he suddenly paused. Hey do you know where Brill's blacksmith is? Sure, it's in the north sector of the city. You can find it if you follow Emperor's Way all the way to Endrin Square. The smithy is on the left when you get there. She raised an eyebrow. Why are you going there? That's the place that outfits all the guards in the north sector. Didn't you just kill a bunch of guards? Bill no. I just knocked them unconscious. As for why I'm going there he smirked. I have a date with the most beautiful woman on the continent. And I'd hate to be late she'd probably turn me into an ice statue. He grinned, waved, and without a sound, vanished from sight. A second later it came and Leon touched down on the roof. The big blonde rushed over. Hey Sheil. Who was that, what was he doing, and tell me damn it if he's single. Sheil craned her head up at Leon as she answered. Well he told me to call him Fox, he's part of some force working against Honest from what I can tell, and as for that last part, he's apparently going on a date right now. Leon swore in a way to make a sailor blush. The cane walked over and knelt by the redeed, who seemed to be in shock still. She glanced back at Leon. You should track him down and gather intel. I will help Shield get out of the city. You got it. Time to crash this date. Leon just watch. Aw oh, you're no fun. Naruto followed the direction he was given to the letter, although admittedly he was questioning whether or not it was a good idea to mention where he was looking to go. What if that girl sent someone to spy on him? That wouldn't be good, at least not until he sorted everything out with Esdith. Once he did that he could take her back to meet Jiraiya and Armin. That at least would allow them to pull together some sort of plan to deal with the Empire, he just hoped that whatever plan was made, he and Esdith would be able to remain close. Thus being separated from her was torture at this point. He still didn't understand it, maybe he wasn't supposed to. But the idea of Esdith being away from him for any extended period of time seemed unacceptable in his mind. It was abhorrent, uncool, and completely out of the question. She was his and he wouldn't allow anyone to tell him they couldn't be together. He didn't give a damn if she happened to be a general of the empire or not. So let's see, where am I? She said to go to the square and it would be on the right I think. Naruto hummed to himself as he glanced around what he correctly assumed was Endrin Square. It was a bit crowded here for his liking. He always imagined that he would meet Esdith in a secluded area maybe in a forest. But now. Abril's blacksmith was a busy destination and obviously well guarded. Was his dear Esdi thinking at all when she told him to come here? Or was she so overcome with the idea of meeting him that she threw out the first place that popped into her head? He stopped humming as he scanned the crowd. It didn't seem to him like anything abnormal or suspicious as going on so why did he have a sudden tickle of apprehension tracing its way up his spine? And why were the hairs on the back of his neck standing on end? Naruto realized the reason a split second later. He was being watched. And not just the casual observation everyone in the city was subjected to. This was a highly focused watching although whoever it was obviously needed someone to show them how to conceal their presence and intent. This spy or whoever it was he or she was just so damn blatant. Worse still the pricking feeling was distracting him from his current objective. Naruto grimaced and continued through the crowd, throwing caution to the wind. He would be damned if he went on another detour. He was meeting Esdith right the fuck now. His eyes flicked from side to side as he moved like water through the crowded square, eventually finding shelter in an alley on the other side. The Brill's blacksmith was just two buildings from him, and through an open window his eyes caught a flash of blue. Pursuit was forgotten as he moved like death shadow past the two guards in front of the blacksmith, they didn't even see him. He was invisible to them despite it being broad daylight. Such was the focus he had on her. Naruto cut through the intervening space like blade through flesh. And then he was there. Esdith let out a startled gasp as his arms twined around her from behind, his lips brushing the graceful curve of her neck. She tensed and looked back as if preparing to dissect him with her sword, only to freeze faster than the ice she had control over. Her eyes so blue met his with their slitted pupils. Naruto would remember the next moment for the rest of his life. She turned her delicate hands infiltrating his jacket, seeking out his skin and linking together behind his back. Then Esdith leaned in and kissed him. Naruto let his eyes close as their lips met feeling nothing in that moment, but her his woman against him. His hands traced upwards his fingers drawing a line up the small of her back. He found her general's hat and removed it, placing his hand behind her head and pulling her deeper into the kiss. She didn't protest in the slightest, all but moaning into his mouth. The temperature dropped like a stone as Naruto asked permission, and Esdith granted it, opening her mouth to him. She tasted sweet. Naruto burned with an unnatural heat as her silken skin flowed against his. He couldn't hear the QB's shouts as he almost absent-mindedly used the beast's chakra to keep himself warm. All he could hear was Esdith and all he could see was darkness. He felt whole. As though a piece that had been missing just fell into place. Surprise bit sharply as Esdith withdrew. His eyes fluttered open even as he instinctively held her tighter. 
he didn't want to be separated from her even the slightest fraction. Now that she was in his arms it would take all of the elemental nations combined to part them. He inclined his head, looking into her baby blues. As Deeth Chan. Her face was flushed, and her cheeks were bright with a ruby tint. She leaned in again whispering past his ear. Let's go someplace private do my personal chambers sound suitable. He shook his head. Too far you live in the palace. As Deeth's already red complexion darkened. There's a nice inn nearby if you'd like. Naruto found her lips again. As Deeth all but swooned into him, the temperature dropping so low that the others in the room fled the scene. He didn't even notice their departure. All he cared about was right in front of him. He broke the kiss reluctantly and rested his head on hers. I would like that. In a small room deep within the bowels of the Imperial Palace, three men were standing in front of a door. It was small and unobtrusive, but made out of an unlikely substance a material that would immediately place suspicion upon its purpose. Mithril. One of the three legendary metals along with adamantium and ethereum. This door was smooth silver, lacking anything in the form of decoration or adornment. In fact it didn't even have a handle. The only thing that graced the front of this door was a small triangular hole in its center, just large enough to insert a finger. Other than that, there was nothing besides what it was made out of to suggest this door to be anything out of the ordinary well, that, and the fact that it hadn't been opened in almost a thousand years. Deep within the palace it rested, undisturbed for centuries. And now it was ready to be opened. Excuse me Prime Minister, but are you absolutely sure this will work? Taking blood from the young emperor I don't think it was wise. The one who spoke was a short man with spiky brown hair and a smallish goatee. His light brown eyes looked up to examine his superior with an uneasy gleam. As much as he was excited to see this door open for the first time since the reign of the first emperor, he was still loyal to the emperor, and taking a blood sample from his without the boy's knowledge was not something he liked. Oh? Honest retorted surprised. And here I thought you were eager to help him. Mess sometimes we must do things for those we care for without their knowledge. What the young master doesn't know can't hurt him in this case. I suppose that may be true. Dot. Honest chuckled. Don't worry about it Cedric. Once this door is opened and I can confirm what lies on the other side, then we can tell his highness. He turned to the last of their small group, a tall lanky youth of about 18. Go ahead boy. Open the door would you? Oh dot of course prime m dot minister he stuttered horribly, but complied, stepping towards the door and placing his hand his pocket as he did so. A second later he pulled out an odd looking object. It looked like a key, but instead of teeth it was round with no protrusions at all. H dot here goes nothing. He placed the tip at the hole and accepted the small vial of blood that Honest provided. This he opened and poured over the strange key. Then he thrust the key into the hole and twisted sharply. For a full moment nothing happened. And then there was a loud hiss. Intricate lines of blue fire ran up the length of the door. They continued through it for nearly a minute before disappearing completely. Then the door abruptly turned transparent and vanished as if it had never been. In its place was a small slivery bracelet with a blue sapphire lock inset in the band. Honest stepped forward, nodding to himself. So it was true. He'd been looking through the records the Empire kept on all the Imperial arms, and two had leapt out at him. The first was a bracelet that could transform into a shield to fit any circumstance. It could become a small shield for a soldier, a massive dome to protect an entire area or an impenetrable door. One diagram of this bracelet had matched this door perfectly. And the second was a tiny gold key that was supposed to be able to unlock any lock in the world or open things that had no keyhole at all. The first was obviously already in use as this door guarding the room beyond. Well the second was already in his possession. He merely didn't have someone who could use it until now. But his patience had paid off, and this unbelievably pathetic young man was able to use the Sukaritan key. And this allowed him to deactivate the door. But it required the blood of the royal family unfortunately. So he'd had to appropriate some from the only living heir remaining. He was actually pretty lucky if he thought about it. The Imperial bloodline had a rather bad habit of only turning out one male heir each generation. If one of them died. Well, he wouldn't worry about that too much. At least not until he decided to have the innocent little Brad executed. Then he'd take the title of Emperor for himself. Wouldn't that be a nice change? Yes it would. Then the artifact that he believed was hidden behind this door would be one of the bigger steps towards his rear sitting in that golden throne. Is it okay to proceed? Cedric asked nervously. I mean it's not every day that we find out an imperial arms capable of blocking any attack is being used as a door. Honest, smirked. It's fine, I'm sure. Let's go in. Cedric nodded and stepped into the room only to shriek in pain as a white spear of what looked like a bone impaled him through the heart. Honest and the stuttering key wielder leapt back as the man pulled free of the spike and stumbled backwards, bleeding like a stuck pig. He turned around, one hand finding the side of the doorway. 
His eyes fell on Honest a split second before his entire body started to turn a light gray. Then without warning he dissolved into a large pile of ash. Honest looked through the door where the pale bone spear that had impaled Cedric retracted. It wasn't actually a spike. It resembled more of a blade and it was connected to the hilt of a weapon. The weapon that nearly brought tears of joy to his eyes. His grin was savage as he stepped forward into the room, ignoring the pile of ash that had once been a loyal follower of the Emperor. Just as he theorized only those of the royal bloodline or imperial arms users could enter this room unscathed it was perfect. Honest's eyes roamed over the weapon, laid out on a large blue cushion. It was beautiful. It was deadly. He rubbed his hands together gleefully, even as he spoke its name out loud for the first time. Shiroi Megami Tsuin Ken you are more beautiful than any description in any textbook. I will enjoy using you to bring me to power white goddess twin sword. Meanwhile, at a fine inn on the north side of the capital, there was man, a man who was pale new ivory and shaking like a twig in a blizzard. This man's name was Marin, and he had just borne witness to possibly the most terrifying thing he would ever see that anyone would ever see in their entire lives. General Esdith, the Ice Queen of the Empire, had just strode into his inn. But no, that wasn't the part that scared him shitless. Not by a long shot. Instead it was the handsome young man with her the man who somehow and seeming without effort was able to tell her the most powerful woman in the world what to do. And he did it with a smile on his face. Right before he kissed Esdith right on the lips. Marin was quite sure that there was now a demon residing within his once fine establishment. A monster in the skin of a man. For surely, what else could tempt the Ice Queen? Who could possibly control her so easily? A mere suggestion from him was accepted and returned with. He shivered, remembering her kissing him back even as they paid for their room. The power radiating off them making him sweat, the fear that coursed through his veins, the terror as the young man smirked at him taking her by the hand and leading her away. The incredibly brief exchange had left him feeling like he was clamped in irons awaiting the gallows. Even when they had no intention of harming him. Almost in spite of the fact that they were paying customers he wanted nothing more than to have them out of his inn. He didn't want them there. Just knowing that the cold-eyed murderess and her tiger-eyed companion were doing gods, knew what in the best room in his inn. It made him feel like he was suffocating. The fear was so so palpable. He remembered all the stories of her. The woman who had joined the capital's army and in less time than it took to blink, had risen to the top on a pillar of power, cruelty, and ice-cold professionalism. He fervently wished that the ground would open up below him and swallow him whole. Anything was better than knowing that someone she who had defeated the entire northern army like it was nothing was here. Marin jumped in terror as the stairs to the second floor creaked. His eyes darted to the side as he dear gods dear gods. Dot Esdith walked down the stairs. Her uniform had been discarded in favor of a loose white button-up shirt and black pants. He tried hard not to stare. She was stunning and terrifying and evil. Blue eyes turned to regard him as she padded barefoot across the floor. He shrank back instinctively as she drew closer, her steps much looser than they had been. It was almost as if she was drunk. No, that wasn't it. More as if she'd abandoned her rigid demeanor. Now she simply used predatory grace. One hand came down on the bar with enough force to knock over a cart horse. Sapphire eyes drilled into him as she spoke. Your best win and oh. Marin's hands traveled at something approaching the speed of light as every bottle of fine wine in his possession appeared on the bar top in less than a second. Then he froze up as her killing intent dropped down on him. One more thing bring me some chocolate sweet, not dark. He swallowed hard and flashed into the back room of the inn, frantically searching around for what she asked for. He prayed to every god he knew, as well as several that he didn't, and a few imaginary ones, that he hadn't used up all of his stock of sweets during the festival three weeks ago, it would still be two days before he received another shipment. And he knew he wouldn't live that long. Then, at last he found them. When he returned Esdith was still there, tapping her finger on the bar impatiently. Her gaze found him even as he presented the entirety of what he had left. One indigo eyebrow rose, and then her hand darted out to take the boxes. Then using her control of ice, she created a platter on which she balanced the boxes, as well as six bottles of the most expensive wine he owned. She was gone inside a second. Marin collapsed onto the counter, feeling his heart close to giving out. He'd never been so terrified at any time in his entire life. It was as if everything had flashed before his eyes when she asked about the chocolates. He silently thanked whichever god or goddess had answered his prayers and promptly passed out on the floor. Upstairs Naruto rested against the headboard of a large bed. It was in the best room the inn had, the VIP room as he would have called it back in the elemental nations. The pillows had been stacked against the back of the bed while he and Esdith. Naruto grinned and shivered pleasantly as he recalled the last hour or so. He sighed and repositioned himself on the bed. The room was honestly a mess. He'd completely lost control of his power the moment the two of them shut the bedroom door but it was a great pleasurable loss of control. 
He doubted that here was a better way to lose it than in bed with the woman of your dreams. Literally in his case. His head snapped up as he heard the door to the room open and close. A moment later as Dee's head peeked around the bedroom door, her eyes trained on him, her skin flushing red again. Naruto. She called out. He beckoned her forward with one crooked finger. She came striding into the room, having already shed the pants she'd put on to go downstairs. His eyes trailed up her legs, admiring every inch of her creamy skin. As Deeth for her part couldn't take her eyes off him, his broad shoulders, chiseled chest, and well-muscled arms. She bit her lip unconsciously as she slid onto the bed, the icy tray coming to rest beside him. He paid no mind to it, catching her and dragging her forward. She let him take her, moaning against him loudly and without caring who might hear. That was good oh so good Naruto silenced her with a kiss. A kiss that turned into a tug of war between them as she tried to dominate it, only to lose to his more aggressive moves. The wine and chocolates laid forgotten as Naruto rolled her over. As Dee's fingers unbuttoned her shirt in seconds, granting him access to her entire body. He didn't disappoint her. His hands wandered every inch, stroking, scratching, and smoothing over her. She was in heaven and hell at the same time. They'd been at this for over an hour, and he still hadn't taken her like she wanted like she needed. But at the same time, she couldn't protest it. He was doing such amazing things to her. There was no way she could let him stop this ecstasy, even if she knew something even better would come after. Abruptly Naruto broke the kiss, pulling back and looking her in the eyes. She stared back as she panted, trying to get her breath back. That was when she felt his hand slide down from her breasts, skimming over her belly, till it reached her lower lips. Naruto's hand came to rest over her mound. His index and ring finger spread her open, and then his middle finger plunged in. Esdith gasped, but was cut off again as he bit her shoulder hard. The gasp turned into a groan of pleasure. Naruto then proceeded to mark her as his. Sharp teeth left red indents in her flesh, while his hard sucking branded her with hickeys. He was intent on making sure everyone knew who she belonged to. Her own hands were wandering too, and while his face was buried in the hollow of her throat, her delicate fingers wrapped around his long hard rod. It was hot, even hotter than his skin was normally, and right now it was practically scalding to the touch. She could only quiver with delight at the thought of it going inside of her. Naruto. He paused long enough for her to understand that he heard what she said, then went back to marking her neck. Esdith couldn't help but moan again as he added a finger to the one already pleasuring her. Damn him damn him for being so fucking good. She tensed, eyes going wide as she felt his sharp canine slide into the soft meat of her throat. It was too much. Her legs clamped together and she screamed out, her orgasm forcing her back to arch of the bed. The longest seconds in her life passed then her mouth opened wide and every muscle taunt as a bowstring. Then she collapsed, boneless to the bed. She was soaked with sweat, out of breath, and still more than ready for the next round. Naruto hovered above her for a moment and then withdrew his fingers from her sweet spot. Even as she watched he brought them to his lips and licked them. The sight caused the uncomfortable heat in her chest to pulse. She felt that she might be lit on fire if it grew any more. She wanted him wanted him so bad. As Deeth Chan, he asked, somewhat curious. MMM. His eyes roamed over her flushed face. What was it you wanted before? She didn't answer for a moment, too exhausted to move. But after a minute, she collected her strength and forced her hands to search out what she'd discovered earlier. The second Esdith found it she squeezed. Naruto's eyes went half-lidded while he shivered. She smiled as best she could, stoking him slowly, enjoying every groan that escaped his lips. I want this. He gasped. The strain of holding back was becoming impossible to overcome. His entire body was demanding that he take her. So he did. Naruto grabbed her by the shoulders and pulled her forward. Her breasts pillowed against his chest as she came to rest in his lap. Both of them gasped pleasantly as his member slid between her thighs. As Deeth was biting her lip again. Their eyes met and a silent question was asked. I want to be on top. As Deeth said bluntly, answering his query. The dark and not at all innocent chuckle escaped him. I have no problem with that. She smirked and put a hand in the center of his chest, fingers splaying out over his solar plexus. MMM lay back Naruto I want to take this big boy for a ride. Dot. Naruto was about to comment on that, but he was robbed of words the instant as Deeth moved. Or well he did have one thing to say as she slipped forward, pushing him down and lining herself up with his manhood. Fuck me. Her smirk turned predatory as she raised her hips and used one hand to position him at her entrance. Oh I intend to now put those hands and mouth of yours to work, I don't want to be able to think or speak clearly when this is over understood. He licked his lips and felt the QB's chakra starting to rise inside him. That can be arranged as Deeth Chan. There was a moment of silence as both of them stared into each other's eyes. And then as Deeth, her gaze still locked on his, lowered herself. A long breath escaped him as he felt himself penetrating her folds. 
At first he felt nothing but the odd sensation of his beep slipping into something soft and wet. Then the head disappeared inside her, and the fit became much tighter. Bezdeeth forced herself not to break eye contact as she lowered herself, each inch causing her thighs to tighten on his hips until it became crushing. Through the touch of her hand on his chest Naruto could feel her trembling. Ah. Dot fuck Naruto shouted as Ezdith seemed to lose the strength in her legs and dropped down the rest of the way, impaling herself of his beep with a scream. Flesh met flesh with a loud slap, and they held still for a long moment. Naruto twitched savoring the sudden unbelievable pleasure jolting up his spine, and Ezdith breathless and shaking, tried not to collapse. Almost a minute went by as the two lovers recovered, and then Ezdith drew in a deep breath. Then, taking it slow, Ezdith rotated her hips forward trying to get a feel for it. Naruto noted her expression was confused. Be dot as Deeth chan He asked, groaning a bit as he felt her beat pulsing around his shaft. But it doesn't hurt. What? She shook her head and raised herself up. Naruto gasped as the cold air of the room rushed in to cool his member. But only a second, as Deeth lowered herself again carefully almost cautiously. Then she met his gaze again. I was told this would hurt she mumbled, somewhat embarrassed that she believed it would be quite painful. But it doesn't. There was a moment of silence between them, and then Naruto chuckled. He yeah I was wondering. My sensei told me that the whole pain thing isn't really common. That's mostly older women trying to scare little girls away from it. Either that or they were stupid themselves and didn't do any for play. As D. Saibra raised. And how would he know? Naruto shrugged as best he could. Sensei took me to a whorehouse when I was 15, so that I would and I could lose his fascination with women's private parts. Dot but I don't think it worked because my sensei is the biggest perv I know. Anyway, he writes smut novels, and as much as I think they suck his information is accurate. He smirked and licked his lips, his hands running up her creamy thighs. So wanna get back to it. I don't know about you, but this feels awesome lips pulling back into a seductive grin, as Deeth nodded and started grinding down again, no longer cautious or slow. She eagerly moved her hips back and forth, earning a long groan from her lover. Naruto's head fell back a second later. As Deeth was speeding up, small whimpers and moans escaping her as well. The initial unease and strange feeling of sex faded and in its place was the tingling hot pleasure she'd heard came after. She bit her lip, leaning forward and putting both her hands on Naruto's chest. Their eyes met again. Are you going to make me do all the work Naruto? He chuckled groaned and moved his hands to her waist. Not a chance in hell Esdith chan with strength that a normal man wouldn't have been able to use from that position, Naruto lifted Esdith and flipped her over. His blue slitted eyes now gazed upon hers from above. But I changed my mind about being on the bottom. Her eyes seemed to flash with something predatory. Then you better start fucking or I'm going to make you suffer. Naruto's grin matched her own as he held her down with one hand, lining himself up with the other. She watched for a second, but closed her eyes as his head parted her tight lips, then he slowly slid into her again, inch after inch disappearing until he was fully sheathed in her. His own eyes closed while he basked in the pleasure. It was now or never. Lemon happened. It was another minute before either of them moved, but when she sat up and looked around Naruto was already doing the same, drawing on the QB's chakra to heat himself as he did so. The first words out of her mouth were did dot did I. He merely nodded, not trusting himself to speak. Naruto felt extremely lucky in that moment that his beep hadn't turned into an ice pop and broke off. But his attention was more on Esdith herself. Half of him a bit uneasy now and fearful that her next orgasm would turn him into an ice statue, while the other half was amazed by how beautiful she was covered in frozen drops and seeming dusted with powder as she was. It seemed even the moisture in the air around them had be frozen drifting down to blanket her like ultra-fine snow. Even the room around them looked like a frozen wasteland. The wine bottles were cracked from the expanding ice inside, the windows were now rhymed in frost, and even the walls were coated with a paper-thin sheet of ice. As Deeth looked as well and her cheeks quickly colored the shade of blood, her embarrassment at losing control over her powers like that probably more than she'd felt since she was a child. I dot dot sorry Naruto. I didn't mean to accidentally freeze everything are you okay, her voice turned shrill towards the end when she saw he was still hard. She mistakenly thought she'd frozen his manhood solid and her eyes widened in horror. Naruto. Throwing caution to the wind he crawled quickly forward, embracing her. As Deeth chan it's fine I'm not hurt or anything. It's just surprised me is all. You didn't lose control that bad. Don't worry about it. Esdith, feeling mollified now, nodded. His beep wasn't frozen after all he was merely still hard, regardless of his near-fatal encounter with her powers. Are you sure it's alright? Dot she asked, somewhat hesitant. After all, it wasn't every day you nearly killed your lover during your first time. I'm good just a bit cold at all. But I can use my chakra to keep warm. He wrapped his arms around her, holding tightly as he kissed her forehead. I guess I can't expect you to have complete control over your powers. 
Especially when I lose control sometimes too. She swallowed hard. But that's the first time I've lost control since I mastered using eyes, and that was a long time ago. Hey. Dot don't worry about it Esdith. Naruto grinned, his blue eyes coming to rest close to hers as their noses touched. It's not like anyone can expect to keep control over their power when they're like that. Besides your Tigu is part of you isn't it? That isn't like others who use equipment-based Tigu. They can just take it off. There was a moment of silence as the temperature in the room slowly rose, the warmer air from outside melting the ice-coated windows, while it took a couple minutes for the blankets to return to normal. Then at last, Esdith accepted that she wasn't to blame and relaxed against him. That was too close Naruto. I know he sighed. You want to try again? Their head jerked around. But I just lost it. He put a hand behind his head, scratching his neck nervously. Yeah I get that. But you only get better by trying. Naruto's lips turned upwards in a sly smirk. You can be on top this time Haim. Dot. Haim? Means princess in my language. He replied with a small smile. His eyes drew downwards to the beads of sweat that had resumed their trip between the valley of her breasts. He swallowed hard. Well. I'm not even close to being tired. Dot I could go for a few rounds still. Eyes narrowing, Esdith turned around and straddled him. Naruto chuckled at her determined expression, even though it was clear she was a bit winded. I'll hold you to that she leaned in to kiss him, and he accepted it, one hand slipping behind her head to keep her there. Esdith pushed him back again. Her hand splayed out over his chest while her eyes fluttered closed. Both of them put the accident out of their minds, letting the slow-burning passion build up into an inferno again. Less than ten minutes passed and the innkeeper, who just woken up on the cold wood floor, heard the sounds of a couple in the midst of well, it wasn't too hard to guess what they were doing. The loud slaps, moaning, and the creaking of wood told the older man all he needed to know. Naruto and Esdith were left unaware upstairs as Marin collapsed in a dead faint for a second time, welcoming the embrace of the inky darkness. Meanwhile not far away two feminine figures were hidden within view of the inn's second floor. One was shorter, quite small with long black hair and crimson eyes. Her pale skin was flushed red and her eyes were unfocused. While the other was far more developed with fair skin and large breasts tucked away in a leather tube top. This second figure was also blonde and there was now small amount of blood dribbling down her chin, stemming from her nose. Her eyes too were somewhat unfocused. An hour passed. Two hours passed. Four hours passed. The blonde turned to the girl beside her. A came. Yes. They've been fucking like animals for how long now? The dark-haired girl seemed to ponder this question for a long moment before she at last looked upwards, turning her gaze to the afternoon sky. About six hours. Fuck me. The came nodded. You wish you were in there. As if. I don't care if the guy is blonde or a hunk. He's been in the same bed with Esdith Partas of all the girls in the empire, and I don't give a damn how long he's been in there any man who that bitch would fuck is probably not someone I want to mess with Leon closed her eyes as her enhanced hearing picked up on another series of impassioned cries. Then dot Naruto. Dot fuck me. Dot fuck me harder more and more. The long sigh escaped her. But damn I wish I had a hot guy who could pin me down and do me like that. I think we should report back to the base and tell everyone. Leon glanced to the side. Tell them what? The came shrugged. Tell them that the Ice Queen has a lover, and if my guess is right then she wouldn't become close to someone who wasn't at least as strong her. She looked to the left, meeting Leon's gaze. You remember what the boss told us. She is fanatical about survival of the fittest. If there is a new player on the board one on par with her, then the others need to know. Oh fine we'll go as soon as they finish. I want to listen in on their pillow talk. The came deadpan so hard that somewhere back in Kanoha, a certain Anbu operative sneezed. Hey. I'll have you know that I've listened into plenty of officials and guard captains after they got laid. You'd be amazed how much info they're willing to give to a girl after they fucked them. I'm serious. Leon insisted. The busty blonde gave a long groan. Okay okay fine. I just want to get off on listening to them go at it and imagine the guy is doing me. Satisfied. The came nodded. Eki. Dot she stood and proceeded to walk away from her partner, intent on returning to base. But from behind her, Leon stood and shouted with finger pointed accusingly at her back. You. You don't know what it's like being a woman with needs in a place where the only men are a pathetic perv and a buff homosexual. I want to get laid, but my standards are already too low as they are. The accusing finger trembled as Leon's rage built. You don't know my pain. I can only get so much satisfaction from teasing mine or beating up Lubbock. The came nodded again as if to confirm her earlier assertion. Eki. Then she turned and leapt off the roof. Leon was left, finger pointed with a self-righteous near plastered upon her face. Finally she dropped her arm and grumbled, turning back to the building they'd been observing. Stupid it came. 
That girl is gonna be totally blindsided when some hot guy comes on to her for the first time. And boy oh boy I am so going to be there when it happens. She won't escape me then. She chuckled evilly and sighed, imagining the teasing she could inflict upon the younger assassin. Oh yes it would be great and merciless torture. No way in hell would a came escape her when the time came hell, she might just get the others in on it too. Then she'd get even for this humiliation yes. Then she'd score some super hot animalistic guy too, and she'd get her brains fucked out every night. Leon's evil chuckles degenerated into perverted giggles as she kept her ears pricked to the sounds coming from the best room of the local inn. Meanwhile as Naruto and Esdith were doing a hem things Jiraiya and Armin were talking with the two newly awakened teens who'd been saved the night before. They identified themselves as Leiasu and Seo. Both were from the same village to the south of the capital out in the country. Their lands had been owned by the empire for a thousand years, yet they were still considered foreigners to the capital itself. And like many of the villages in the backwater area of the empire, they were milked for taxes to an extreme degree. So in a desperate bid to save their village, both of them had left with their best friend Tatsumi to join the imperial army, hoping to send back their earning to keep the village alive. But things had taken a turn for the worse rather quickly. They'd been separated from Tatsumi, who had all their money, while together they had all the provisions. But neither of them saw a point in waiting. After all Tatsumi was strong enough to get there on his own. He was easily the best fighter between them. Seo had recommended that they continue on their way since their destination was still the same. Tatsumi would just arrive a day or so after them probably. But that was when things went south for them. Upon arriving in the capital they discovered that they couldn't afford a room at even the most run-down inn. So they were forced to sleep outside. Both of them had been ecstatic when the rich girl came by and picked them off the street, taking them into her home and even offering a place to stay for a while. But the following night it all came crashing down around them. After dinner, Leiasu had come to in a prison cell, and right outside Seo was being whipped by that same girl. What followed was the most brutal torture either of them could have ever imagined neither of them could really tell how long they'd been there after the first day. The pain robbed them of their sense of time, making minutes seem like hours and hours as days. Seo said that she couldn't remember much at all. After a while, her mind just shut down to try and block out the agony. Leiasu on the other had he remembered everything that had been done to him in perfect clarity. To say it had been awful would have been a gross understatement. But then then the blonde boy had appeared and killed both of the sick torturers, ending their lives like the trash they were. He'd freed Seo and him. And that was pretty much it. There was nothing left to tell. So now Jiraiya and Armin sat there digesting the information, wondering what to do with these two. Their provisions were gone, they didn't have their weapons, no money, and not even the clothes on their backs. Point in fact Seo was wearing one of Jiraiya's kimonos which looked like a tent on her small frame. But it did the job of covering up her nakedness at least the parts that weren't still heavily bandaged. Leiasu was less picky about his appearance, but this didn't change the fact that they had nothing. Joining the army wasn't an option now. They didn't have the money to buy a commission, and besides that neither would be recovered for another week at the very least. Well? What do we do Jiraiya? Armin asked hesitantly. It doesn't feel right leaving them on their own. There's no way they could make it. Jiraiya didn't like to admit it, but Armin was right. He couldn't let these two continue on their own in the state they were in. That would be simply cruel. But what were their options? He and Naruto needed to get a feel for this place and quickly. And already Naruto had run out on his own, and he was saddled with three civilians. It was like the world was purposely fucking with him. I have to agree. The issue with it is simple. These two are going to be serious baggage. If only we could find this Tatsumi fell, Jiraiya paused as he realized something. Wait Seo was it? Is your friend Tatsumi a young man with brown hair and green eyes a little overexcited perhaps? Her jaw hung loose and Leiasu jumped up. You've met him already. Just briefly. He nodded. He was there when we were attacked by a monster on the road. Naruto took care of it and the kid rushed over to see how it was done. Seo sighed. That does sound like Tatsumi, so he was just a little behind you? Yes. Leiasu turned to Seo. This is great. He's probably already bought a commission with the guards and will be waiting for us to come by. Jiraiya held up his hand. Wait, not quite so hasty. They fell quiet, obeying the older man's order. The toad sage continued. Neither of you are in any condition to go anywhere yet. The toad oil healed the wounds you sustained to the outside, but it will take much longer to heal internal injuries. Only a master of natural energy could use it properly. It's a miracle it works so well on you. The twin looks of dejection on their young faces reminded him of Naruto when he couldn't master a jutsu. That sucks the big one-man Leiasu moaned in dismay. But I guess I can't complain. Better than being dead huh? Seo nodded quickly. Very. Jiraiya waved them off. Don't worry too much about it. 
I'm just saying that you need to limit your movement for another day or two, just to be sure that there aren't any complications. I'm no healer. All I know about the healing arts I know from watching others with far more skill in it than I. The bigger problem right now is the sheer size of this place and your lack of money. We know. Seo muttered, not liking the fact that they were helpless. Not one bit. Here I've got a deal for you too. Jurei emotioned to Armin. Both of you were planning on joining the army. Well Armin here needs someone to guard him when me and Naruto aren't around to do so. Once you two are recovered you can protect him. And in exchange we'll pay your way. How does that sound? Seo and Leiasu shared a look. For a moment it seemed that they would agree, until Leiasu finally shook his head. I'm sorry, but we can't. Our village needs the money. If we can get into the army and rise through the ranks, even if only one of us made officer, it would be enough to save our home. Seo inclined her head in agreement. There was a long pause. And then don't be fools. Both kids turned to Armin. The man had crossed his arms over his chest and wore a scowl. You'll never get close to that rank in the empire. It doesn't matter how strong you are unless you're someone with the strength and drive of Buto or Esdith. The capital is corrupt. Almost every single officer commission is bought these days not earned. Hard work doesn't mean anything unless you're working hard to fill the coffers of the men in charge. That's. Armin grimaced. Look at it this way. Do you think that the family who tortured you would have been able to do what they did if they weren't rich and influential? Crimes like that aren't uncommon. And before I was kicked off the Emperor's Advisory Council by Honest, the higher-ups were already turning corrupt. They abused their power to increase their wealth. And the military is one of the areas worst hit by the taint that clutches at this city's heart. Leasu's face fell. So even if we did work hard and earned it, we wouldn't get promoted to the position we need unless we were willing to do dirty work for the rich. Exactly. Armin nodded. That's why I was offering for you to work with us. We might be against the Empire, and our eventual goal is to take down Honest, so that he can't bring war to our home however, Armin has access to resources, enough to pay your way at least. Jurea gestured to Armin who agreed silently. What about after that? Jurea shrugged. If you're still interested in working with us, then I can pay you with my own money. The only issue is the currency exchange. We need to find a way to trade in the gold I have on hand. Right now our funds are limited to what Armin had saved up. Armin glanced to his left. How much do we have left by the way? I know I had a great deal saved, but the trip to your continent and back put a serious dent in it. Well let me check. Dureya reached a hand into his shirt pocket and retrieved his wallet. His eyes narrowed ever so slightly. It felt lighter than usual. He frowned and opened it, wondering if he'd pulled out a different wallet. But what he saw inside made it blatantly obvious what had happened. Armin coughed loudly. Well. The legendary Sanin sighed tiredly as he retrieved the torn scrap of paper from inside the leather folds of his wallet. This too he opened trepidation evident on his features. That brat didn't spend it on something when I wasn't looking did he? No way he'd do that he knows our money was running low towards the end of our trip. The paper's message read thusly. See you another time sensei. I hope you didn't think that prank earlier was the only punishment for waking me up. By the way I dous, I don't owe you shit. Armin snatched the paper from Jurea, even as the sage closed his eyes and released an agonized groan. The younger man read the message, then reread it. Finally he crumpled it up into a ball with one eye twitching madly. I guess we will know how much money we have when Naruto gets back. Seiya looked between them. Um is this room paid for already? Jurea's head snapped to Armin. Please tell me you paid for more than one night. A small shake of Armin's head was the only answer Jurea received. Fuck. Back in a certain inn on the other side of the capital. Fuck. I know right. You're amazing with your hands Naruto ah. A dot a little lower. MMM one more time as Deeth chan N dot no I'm exhausted. The low chuckle escaped Naruto as he kissed the nape of her neck. Almost immediately she leaned back into him. His hands wrapped around her and he nibbled her ear. You sure? I can keep going you know. As Deeth stifled a moan as his hands cupped her breasts, fingers sinking into her pliable flesh. Meanwhile he was blowing hot air over her skin. A shiver racked her frame even as he answered. D. Tomorrow, Naruto. Naruto rested his head on her shoulder, whispering seductively into her ear. What about now? One hand rose to brush at her lips. Don't you want to keep going? I can do the work if you're tired. Come on, Esdith Chan, one more time. She shook her head. Later, her hands caught his. Now stop teasing me, Naruto. Don't want a Naruto whine, pulling his arms closer. It feels so fucking good. I don't want to stop. Dot, besides, you taste so good. He licked her neck languorously, savoring her. She was amazing like sugar and salt. As Deeth turned and pushed him down onto the bed again. As tempting as it would be not now. I can only go so long without resting Naruto. She smiled and laid herself down on his chest, her head coming to rest just under his. 
However I would enjoy hearing more about you. You're still a mystery to me. I want to know all your secrets. Naruto groaned and snatched a pillow from the back of the bed and propped himself up on it. Once he was comfortable he wrapped his arms around Esdith again. What did you want to know? Well? She went silent for a long moment, thinking about what to ask. What is your family like? Bon Naruto said, his mood dropping like a stone. My dad was the last of his clan. My mom's clan was annihilated by the other hidden villages when she was little. My sensei told me that I'm the last Namikaze and probably the last Yuzumaki. There might be a few distant cousins out there though. Oh I didn't mean to bring up bad memories she sighed. Do you know what they were like? Naruto nodded. My sensei told me that the Namikaze clan was famous for their deadly knife-based fighting and for their speed. He also said that Namikaze were renowned for being a lot smarter than most people. The Yuzumaki were known for a lot of things. They had godlike stamina, a talent for kinjutsu, and powerful sealing. Ezdith hummed thoughtfully as Naruto's arms wrapped around her, her eyes closing. So what about your village? How is it organized? I, I don't really know how to describe it. It's big, but nowhere near as big as this place. It's in the middle of the biggest forest on the continent, and its name reflects that. Since Kanahagakur means village hidden in the leaves. The village is divided into the civilian and ninja sections. The ninja like me are the military force, and about 30% of the whole village are ninja. What are the ranks? So you take out contracts on people? Esdith nuzzled into him, loving the steady beat of his heartbeat on her skin. You said that ninja are essentially assassins. He chuckled. Yeah that's true, but assassinations are only a small part of what we do. Our ranks officially are Jenin, Chunin, Jonin, and Kage. Although the Kage is actually the leader of the village. I know there's a term for Kage level ninja, but I can't remember it. Jenin are rookies. They don't have much experience or they aren't very strong. Junin have more experience automatically and are usually 10 to 20 times as strong as a fresh Jenin. Jonin are the elite of the village and only a few ever make it to that level. I'd say that the average Jonin could take on between 4 and 10 Chunin, depending on the circumstances. And you're a Jenin still. Esdith didn't sound disdainful, but it was obvious that she wanted an explanation for why he was so low ranked. The thing is I'm easily Jonin level I'm as strong as a Kage, but I lack experience for the most part. Or at least that's what Pervy Sage tells me. The point is that I was taking the Chunin exams three years ago to become a Chunin. But the village was attacked during the finals and there it made such a mess that only one of the Jenin got promoted. And after that I went on a three-year training trip with my sensei, like I told you before I didn't have the chance to get promoted yet. Since it's not war time right now, Jureya can't do a field promotion. I see she smiled a bit. That's okay then. Naruto nudged her curiously. Would you be angry if it was for another reason? MMM, she seemed thoughtful. How should I put this? I know that you're an outgoing and determined person Naruto so from my point of view, it's your village's fault that you were not promoted. I might be pissed if I thought they were holding you back on purpose. Thanks, Haim. Uh huh. So I hate to bring it up now Naruto started. But what are we going to do about you? Esdith shifted, glancing up at him. What about me? Naruto sighed. You know the part where me and my sensei are probably going to try and kill Prime Minister Honest. The part where you wanted to be with me no matter what, even if it meant defecting from the Empire. Oh. She went silent for a long while. Eventually Esdith sat up, turning to face him. Naruto's eyes, despite the topic of their conversation, wandered down her gorgeous body. Kami what did I do to deserve this? I think I could lose myself with her. Naruto shook his head slightly as he realized Esdith was speaking. Sorry could you repeat that last bit? He received an appraising eyebrow arch followed by Esdith crossing her arms underneath her breasts and lifting them. Slowly. Her eyes tracked his as he couldn't help but get distracted again. Naruto. Why dot yes Esdith chan How can you be so fixated on my breasts? We've been having sex for I don't know how long. Her expression was just a tad exasperated. Naruto grinned lopsidedly. In my defense I did say I wanted to go a few more rounds. You said that hours ago before I was exhausted. So? So focus Naruto. She chided him. His grin remained firmly in place as his eyes followed the sway of her bust from side to side. Abed Esdith Chan I am focusing. Her serious expression cracked as her blush returned. She bit her lip and leaned forward, pressing her breasts into him. Naruto groaned, feeling himself harden under her. And at the same time, he reached up and pulled her face to his. Their lips brushed and then both of them stiffened. Naruto and Esdith's eyes went wide as they froze, barely a half inch away from each other. Naruto was the first to speak. Um Esdith Chan who is that? She didn't answer for a moment, beeping her head to the side. I don't know but whoever it is has been spying on us for a while, either that or they're terrible at hiding their presence. It's a woman or a girl I can't believe I didn't notice her scent before. It's so clear now. 
percent. Burrito nodded, sliding out from under her and stalking towards the wall closest to the bed. Once he reached the window, he glanced back. If she has been listening in then she knows who we are and what we're planning to do we can't let her get away. A knowing look came over Esdi's face. Understood she extended a hand and summoned a spear of ice. Open the window Naruto I can feel where she is. No your style of fighting is too obvious. Let me handle this. Naruto gave her a quick smile and formed a hand seal. Instantly, he was dressed in his usual outfit. He then focused on the energy signature outside and vanished, leaving only a swirl of leaves in his place. Bezdeeth let out a long breath as she dispersed her ice spear. Her arm dropped and she reclined back on her bed. Oh Naruto come back soon. I miss you already. Leon was aggravated. She'd been listening to them for a while since a came left, but their pillow talk had just started moments ago, and it was fascinating. Esdith was madly in love with an assassin from some hidden village, and he was planning on killing the prime minister. This was way better than she could have ever expected. And yet almost as soon as it was getting good their voices dropped off to the point where she only heard one word in five clearly. It seemed they'd wised up and started to discuss the matter in hushed voices. That was just great. She wouldn't have anything to tell everyone else besides Esdith was defecting. And while that was great news, no excellent news the others would want more details. For instance to whom was Esdith defecting? She didn't know much of anything about this guy. Besides obviously that Esdith had the hots for him. Or was it the colds? She was an ice user after all, and her title was the ice general. Perhaps that would be a better description. Leon shook her head as she tried to sharpen her hearing by turning her head in the direction of the inn's second floor window. The only problem was she wasn't in her Lionel form, so she couldn't use her superhuman senses. And now that they were being cautious she couldn't risk going into the form to eavesdrop better. Damn it if they'd only speak up they completely dropped off now she groaned. Today just isn't my day. Who exactly do you think you're spying on miss? Leon went rigid at the voice. Her head slowly turned and her mind raced. How did he get out of the inn, cross the street, and get behind me without me noticing? And how did he sense me in the first place? She coughed lightly as she turned around fully and met his sapphire blue eyes. They were hard, hard as steel and drilling into her. A shiver ran up her spine as she felt the raw unrestrained power all but dripping from him. His slitted pupils seemed to contract and his fists clenched. Leon giggled nervously, rubbing the back of her neck in apprehension. Yue wouldn't happen to know the saying better to ask forgiveness than permission would you? How much did you hear? Leon broke out in a cold sweat. She stammered dot dot s dot sum. His eye twitched. You're coming with me. Mercy? I'm not sure I would call it that. Leon swallowed. Well I am by. She bolted over the roof intent of escape, only to come face to fist with a blonde man who was defying gravity as he stood on the wall in front of her. Leon had about two seconds to ponder at the impossibility of standing on a wall like it was level ground, then she experienced an instant of blinding pain, and inky blackness overcame her. The end. So how was this part, I hope you like it. And if you like it share this part with your friends, and like the video too. And don't forget to subscribe our channel for daily awesome fanfiction. Okay it's time for me to go. Bye bye.